Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Ashley Leonard, and I am excited for you all to be joining us here today for our spotlight on student voice, centering youth, centering young people as experts in student experience. Um, before we jump into the session today, I just want to highlight a couple of our other upcoming to and through events, and then we'll get started. Um, we have three more events before the end of the school year. The first is on May 14th featuring the People's Music School, talking about the use of quantitative and qualitative data um, to deepen their, the, um, their student impact throughout their long-term journeys. Our team will also be hosting um, an in-person event, Kegs and Cases, which I know was very popular last year, um, on May 30th from 4 to 6 o'clock p.m. Um, at Guild Row um, here in Chicago. And then finally, on June 18th, um, our colleagues and friends at One Goal will um, be presenting at our data collaborative about how they help CPS students through the college application process and a couple of the challenges that they're currently grappling with. So if you'd like to RSVP for any of those events, um, you can click the link that Alex Ritson just shared in chat or check out our website for more information. So now let's get into today's session. So today's session is going to be, like I mentioned before, the spotlight on student voice centering young people as experts in their experience. Today's session really furthers the mission and vision of To and Through that is grounded in creating equitable learning experiences and educational outcomes for CPS students from the middle grades through college graduation. And we really do this work by helping educator stakeholders like you figure out how you can use data for inquiry and impact. One space where we use data for inquiry and impact is through our middle grades network. Um, the middle grades network launched in January of 2020. And since then, we've partnered with more than 100 educators at 22 CPS schools across the city that have served a little over 4,700 students in the middle grades. Today's session specifically focuses on Sumner Math and Science, a school in the second cohort of the Middle Grades Network. Our presenters will share how Sumner has integrated student voice into their work throughout their MGN journey in order to improve student sense of belonging in ways that positively impact both academic and social emotional outcomes. So it is now my honor to introduce our two presenters for the day, Naomi Wilfred and Lori Glick. Naomi is a visionary, a dreamer, and a disruptor. In her current role as Middle Gates Network Coach here at Two and Through, she oversees our student fellowship and works closely with schools to develop ways to improve the Middle Grades experience. Prior to her current role, she taught for nearly a decade. During her tenure with Chicago Public Schools, she worked to provide identity-centered learning experience rooted in liberation. She has a BSE from the University of Kansas and an MED in special education from Loyola University here in Chicago. She is also recently engaged. Her mother, an amazing education, educator who is also joining us today, is one of her biggest inspirations. She loves to travel, read, bike, and attend concerts. And additionally, she is a great host, avid sports fan, and loves to sing. Our second presenter is Lori Glick, the middle school lead teacher at Sumner Math and Science Academy. Lori teaches seventh and eighth grade math and science at Sumner Math and Science Academy on Chicago's West Side. With 18 years of experience, she prides herself on consistent high expectations for students while building their confidence in their math and science abilities. Lori has a diverse background with a BA in African-American studies and mass communication and advertising, as well as experience in hospitality, gaming, human resources, and accounting. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Naomi to get us into the presentation. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you so much, Ashley. I appreciate that wonderful introduction. We are so excited to be with you all today. Thank you so much for being here. Yes, she shouted out one of my biggest inspirations. My mother is here, educator of 40 years, uh, still teaching teachers. So really glad to share this work uh, that we have done this year. Um, so a quick agenda, we're gonna do an opener and I'll talk walk you through a little bit of the middle grades network journey. 
Uh, we're going to bring in a bit of the research. We are you Chicago. We recognize research is our jam. Uh, I'll give a little bit of the student fellowship overview and a look at Sumner Elementary, who's just been doing some wonderful work this year. Uh, and then we'll see student voice in action and then leave some time for Q&A. Like, let's go ahead and get started. Opener today is this, and we'd love to see your responses. Let's go through the objectives really quickly. Uh, we will spend some time providing insight into the work of intentional student voice engagement by sharing strategies for educators to implement uh, throughout a continuous improvement cycle and engaging discussion about best practices um, around student voice implementation. So just a little look at what we have planned for today. So our opener, we love an opener. So we'd love to hear from your responses in the chat. When was the last time you implemented a suggestion from a young person or student? And this could be teacher student, it could be administrator student, it could be parent child, it could be administrator child, nonprofit partner, whatever type of situation you're in, we would love to hear your responses in the chat. When was the last time you implemented a suggestion from a young person or a student? No problem. So we might not have access to the Q&A or chat, and that's totally fine. You can reflect on that at this moment, really thinking about the last time. I see, okay, last week. Thank you, someone coming in there. Um, really thinking about the last time you implemented a suggestion from a young person or a student. You can just take some time. Oh, there we go. We've got folks coming in. We've got it. Thank you so much. Hi there. Hey. All right. We've been hearing from students about the need to support them and recognize them as whole individuals. Financial literacy, got it. We recently ran branded one of our programs based of alumni from um, our um, alumni board. Wonderful. Relying upon our social media student worker. Thank you so much, Holly. I appreciate that. All right. Try to model advocacy and taking the opinions of your three-year-old seriously. Recently changed the bedtime routine because they asked for that. Wonderful. All right, supported a team to make practice changes around meaningful work based on Elevate feedback this week. Wonderful, thanks Jess. We'll talk about Elevate in just a little bit. Awesome, awesome. All right, we'll to see if there's a few more coming in. Okay, a little about a month ago, your brother asked me how studying could be helpful for him. You adjusted. So thinking of maybe the, the sibling relationship there. Thank you, Jessica. Wonderful. So really thinking about, you know, when are we listening to the voices of young folks? And we'll talk a lot about that today and the Sumner journey with that. Feel free to keep writing those in the chat, but we are about to dive in and really see what the work was this year. So Ashley gave you all a bit of an overview of the Middle Grades Network about what we do, who we are. Um, this is kind of a snapshot of that journey. It is a three and a half year partnership in which we work closely with um, uh, Chicago Public Schools to really improve this middle grades experience. Um, Sumner right now is in year two. They're really continuing to work on uh, strengthening their educator capacity, establishing effective team structures and use, utilizing quantitative and qualitative data tools. Along with the MG and educator experience, we also have a student fellow experience, and I'll dive into that a little bit more in just a bit, but just recognizing that the voices of students and decision making um, with their middle grades experience is invaluable. It is imperative that their voices are centered. So we really do try to align the MG and educator experience with the student fellows. And how can we um, utilize student voice and feedback and some of the changes that educators are making? And you'll see some examples today with Sumner. So let's bring it back to the research. We have used the Search Institute um, for the work of MGN um, since the beginning because they have a really strong relationship um, and focus on relationships and belonging. Um, it's why we really ask schools to look closely at those student educator and peer-to-peer -peer relationships. Um, on the right, you will see their definition of developmental relationships for, for young folks. It really is a focus on self-discovery, agency, and understanding how to engage and contribute with the world. Teacher-student relationships matter, y'all. We know that. Develop re developmental relationships matter in the middle grades. 
All right, so middle school students who reported high levels of developmental relationships with teachers were eight times more likely to stick with challenging tasks, enjoy working hard, and know it is okay to make mistakes when learning, um, when compared to students with low levels of student educator relationships. You might be thinking of your engagement with student um, right now. You might be thinking of your, um, of how students are being able to show up, maybe even your personal experience in the middle grades, but recognizing how important this relationship is. So during Summer Institute, which is a wonderful three-day institute that we have for our teachers, um, um, Sumner School, which is part of cohort two, was introduced to the five elements of relationships powerful in young folks' lives. So there are these, these five key elements. Expressing care, challenging growth, provide support, share power, and expand possibilities. So you might, educators might live in one particular area. It might be an express care. It might be challenge growth. And we challenged our educators to look at what is an area of strength for you and what is an area of growth. And sometimes this space of shared power ends up being the space that is a little bit of a challenge sometimes. But the recognition that this key element is really important in um, the middle grades experience. How are you, you know, continuing to respect me, include me, collaborating, letting me lead? And you'll see examples of that um, in just a little bit with the student fellowship and the work that Sumner has done this year. In addition, there is also the Bell Framework in Action. Uh, we wanna continue to center and share power with BIPOC youth, recognizing what is the equitable approach? What is the way that we are allowing students to co-design, to be agents in their education journey? We really wanna continue to focus on that and really understand that this is a big part of their experience as well. So I mentioned a little bit before the MGN Student Fellowship Overview, a key area of focus for the MGN is student voice. Uh, the Student Fellowship, which goes in alignment with the MGN Educator Experience, remember I explained that three and a half year journey, the students go along with the educators. So the Student Fellowship includes two to four middle grade students from each of our cohort two schools, Sumner being part of cohort two. Uh, it is a focus on non-traditional leaders. It creates um, a space for schools to incorporate feedback and how to make their middle school classroom experience better. So during the fellowship session, students are able to connect with other middle grade uh, students. They develop their leadership skills, analyze data to help their teachers understand the needs of all their students. And most importantly, we have some fun. So this was the middle, uh, this is a, just a brief overview of the um, student fellowship. And let's kind of take a look at what does, what does that look like in action? So we're in year two of programming here. Uh, during year one, we really worked to help build this capacity of student voice and student leaders. We really wanted to build community within the fellowship, um, introduce different types of data to bring back to their teachers, and really just try to understand what is a fellow doing? What, what is our purpose here? Um, how are we continuing to amplify student voice within this experience that your educator, your teachers are having? We are in year two now. Um, we really tried to amp it up a little bit. What does student voice look, sound, and feel like for MGN fellows? How can they use their voice to really lead to, to change? And then how does being a voice, um, what does that look like for myself um, and my peers, right? Not just what student A wants or what you know this student wants, but what do all students want and how can we gather that feedback to um, make change? Uh, we continue to look at our um, leadership this year. Students were able to develop and create change ideas. Uh, students attended uh, five sessions. There were four virtual and two in person. And this last highlighted box here was a goal we had. And actually, it was a goal based on a lot of my meetings with Sumner last year, who kind of talked to me and said, you know, Naomi, there's a great opportunity here. How can we continue to align this experience? How can we have student fellows present? Um, so we made a goal that five out of seven schools will have students participate and or run an MGN team meeting by the end of this year. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that looked like. So the school of the hour. Um, I have had the esteemed pleasure of working with Sumner Math and Science Academy. Um, they are a small K-8 elementary school located in the North Lawndale, Austin neighborhood. They are 98% Black and 92% low income. Really thinking of that Bell framework and centering BIPOC youth and really understanding what the research is saying in terms of equity. 
They have an extremely strong leadership and veteran teacher staff who has really been in the work for quite some time and was really um, focused on how can we continue to work on our on track, but really connect that student sense of belonging. Um, they have very deep ties to their surrounding community and an established student voice committee. So recognizing that a school that really honors and recognizes the power and value of student voice um, really was part of also um, part of the story as well. So as we stated, it's a three and a half year partnership. I'm gonna give a quick little glance of year one and year two. Um, so year one at a glance for Sumner, they focused on meaningful work, which is the Elevate Learning Condition, which really focuses on um, the student experiences. How are students really experiencing your class? And so Sumner as a team has continued to try to understand and dig into the data. Um, they did see a 6% increase um, with students rating po uh, positively with the Meaningful Work Learning Conditions between two Elevate surveys last year. Uh, towards the end of the year, they shifted to classroom community to really try to work to increase engagement. Uh, they decided to implement a morning meeting structure as a result of that shift. But just like we've spoken about, how are students really um, responding to this shift that was made? They really wanted to gauge their interests. How are they liking this? What are they thinking of this? Is this something that's being effective for you? Which in comes our next um, student voice in action during year one. So about this time last year, an MGN student fellow intended their teaming to give explicit feedback from her peers. Teachers were able to adjust morning meeting to meet the needs of their student. And this really sparked the idea of having student fellows um, attend MGN team meetings the following year. So this was, this was about a year in the making. We were like, how can we make this happen? How can we make this authentic? What does this journey really look like? So that led us to this question at the end of last year. How can we incorporate the student fellows into the educator experience into an off, in an authentic and meaningful way? So I'm going to pass it over to Lori, who's going to talk about year two and what the work we've done based on some of these practices we started last year and what that has looked like. What has student voice looked like in action and how have we continued to incorporate the fellows in a meaningful way? So Lori, I'm going to pass it off to you. Oh, I'm so sorry. Before I do that, let's do a quick look at the fellowship goals. I'm so sorry. Students will continue to develop and or contribute to um, change ideas. Remember, this is what I highlighted previously. And then five out of seven schools will have students attend and or participate and run a team meeting this year. So thinking about some of those fellowship goals, thinking about how it aligns with the educator journey. I was just so excited to hear Lori speak. I just jumped ahead. Um, but we're going to hear from her now about the Sumner MGM team in year two. Remember the three and a half year partnership, this is year two. And so how did they start this school year? So Lori, I'll, I'll pass it on over to you. Thank you so much, Naomi. Um, so where did we start this year? Um, as Naomi mentioned, we uh, attended the Summer Institute, which is all about planning and uh, professional development. And one of the ideas that came out of that were the morning meetings. Um, we have a small team um, for homeroom teachers. Our middle grades are considered five through eight here at Sumner. Um, each homeroom teacher does a morning meeting. Um, we, should, we have a morning meeting and an afternoon meeting actually because we switch classes halfway through the through the day. All of our morning meetings are a little bit different, kind of matching our own personality uh, and style, but they all include some component of students sharing thoughts, opinions, feelings. Sometimes that's with the whole group. Sometimes that's uh, on a jam board. Sometimes that's peer to peer, but every day they have an opportunity to have some input into whatever the question or the prompt is of the day. We also want to do um, put some thought into student engagement. So our first team meeting uh, focused on uh, on lessons that we had done in the first few weeks of, of school. So it could be an SEL lesson, it could be an academic lesson, and thinking about what, what lessons we teach that we thought were really engaging for students, and then using the 5Y protocol to identify um, the successful components of, of, that, uh, of that lesson, uh, so that we can continue using those components throughout the year. So for example, um, I chose, for my lesson, uh, my high engagement lesson, uh, 
how how not to make friends. Uh, it was super engaging because it was novel. We usually don't learn how not to make friends or how not to be a friend. It's usually quite the opposite. So it caught them off guard. It also caught their attention. We take the Elevate survey three times a year. So uh, in the early part of the year, we had the opportunity to take a look at the Elevate survey data. The student fellows had already met once and we use a, a combination of that data and feedback from the fellows to decide that student voice was going to be the primary area of focus this year. Um, so this is just a snapshot of the uh, of the Elevate survey. So student voice has three components to um, three components to it. Uh, in this class, my ideas are taken seriously. I have the opportunity to make choices about my work in class, and this teacher uh, responds to student suggestions uh, to make our class uh, our to make our class better. This. This particular uh, question is what we decided to focus on uh, the uh, first. Uh, as you can see, just over half of the students uh, thought that their ideas were taken were taken seriously. Um, one of the things that we really wanted to dive into with this question is, uh, what does this question actually mean to to students? Uh, we have a and this kind of last um, our year one, we focused on we focused on meaningful work, and we did a lot of work on just trying to understand what is the student's perspective. What do they? How do they even define uh, uh, meaningful work? How do they define busy work? And uh, we found that we have very very different ideas. The adult uh, the adult uh, version of what that means is very, very different from the student version. So our first our first, uh, first point of entry into our work was uh, getting this information from the student, trying to decide, trying to figure out, well, what does this actually mean to students? Does, is it that they their peers don't take them seriously? Are they, is it their opinions? Is it their uh, answers to, um, questions, academic questions? Is it their teachers that they don't feel take them, uh, that take them seriously? What exactly was driving this, this response? So as you can see in that picture, um, that's just one of the many ways that we uh, sought student input. So we, uh, some teachers did post-it notes for their explanation of how students uh, felt about this question. Some people did Google Forms, some people did Think, Pair, Share, just to try to tease out what stu where students were even coming from uh, to, to begin with. Um, this led into several more conversations about, all right, so what do we do? What do we do with this information? How do we how do we get students on the same page with their idea of what it means to um, to have your ideas taken seriously? How do we get more student ideas, and how do we and how do we respond to them? So in November, we um, as we we're bouncing ideas around, one of the things that came to my mind was um, maybe I need like a suggestion box. Uh, Google Form suggestion box, but uh, in my classroom, some way that kids can give me feedback, give suggestions, and I can respond to them. Little did I know, Naomi was a step ahead of me, and that was already going to be one of her suggestions for the student fellowship uh, meeting in December. So we kind of steered our students that way. Um, they were super excited about it. Um, they wanted to, our intention was as we thought about this and thought about how to, how to involve and engage the student fellows in this, um, in the, in the um, suggestion, in the suggestion process, we came up with this idea of a classroom suggestion council, which would be led by the, by the fellows. Um, the idea took off uh, with our team of student fellows. Uh, they came up with, I mean, do you want to go to the couple more slides ahead? They came up with, they, um, 
they came up with a a slide deck that they shared with their with their um, homeroom peers. They came up with the um, the actual Google form and the questions that they were going to to ask. So they had we started off with two two questions that would be on the Google form. One, uh, what idea do you have to improve your classroom community? And two, what idea do you have to improve your middle school in, uh, experience? Um, so the idea is we all would have, each, each homeroom teacher would have a link to this uh, Google form posted on Google Classroom where students could access it at all times. There was some front loading on the teacher part in terms of having conversations with uh, students about what is a what's a reasonable suggestion, what is a what is a um, what is a a, a re what's you can't just um, you can't just have a a suggestion that's completely unreasonable like. I don't think we should have homework. I don't think we should have, uh, I think we should use phones. I think, all right, things that just are non-negotiables. But then trying to get students to understand, oh, look, if you want, if you have a suggestion, there's a way to, there's a way to ask, uh, to, to ask or make your suggestion. All right, and there maybe needs to be some uh, justification behind it. There maybe be, uh, is it a school-wide suggestion? Is it specific to your ELA class? Is it specific to your math class? So trying to get students to uh, hone in on their suggestions uh, before, they, before they submitted them. The uh, student fellows also came up with a, some examples um, in their in their slide decks about hey these are some these are some suggestions that are reasonable these are suggestions that uh, are not going to are not going to work so they're getting a double dose of of what a reasonable suggestion or serious suggestion uh, would even be. I want to go back. <laughs> All right. So we had a grand plan for how this was all going to work. This big, big idea, lots of logistics and moving parts and how this was going to work, the cadence of the suggestions, uh, who was going to lead these conversations, all sorts of things. So after our first after our first round of suggestions, see in the uh, in the photos, those are our student fellows at our MGN team meeting where they are where they are um, they are talking with with the teaching team about what is actually um, about some of the suggestions and where they are coming from and what what uh, which of these suggestions could we actually implement. So on the next slide, I'm gonna go one more. On the next slide, so these, you can see these are just a handful of suggestions. They're mostly fifth and sixth grade suggestions uh, about uh, ways that uh, we could improve their experience or their or their uh, classroom. So we went through these. Um, we tried to pick out things that were. Um, easy fixes so things like brain breaks or mindful minutes all right that's an easy that's a easy fix um the having um when students or one of their suggestions about um about consequences all right so and feeling like there it was a whole group consequence instead of just instead of just the individuals so how do we how do we address how do we address that having specific conversations with the with the students when consequences came up explaining why the consequences are are in place um we had some of these other bigger ideas about a school a school um a school store <laughs> um 
virtual office hours, in-person office hours, things that were not easy, not easy fixes and really would take some manpower to to put into to put into place. But it was really great like talking to the to the student fellows about what was actually about some of their su suggestions. So <clears throat> one of the thing, one of our roadblocks, one of our challenges with these big ideas was it was exactly that. It was a big idea that this is probably not going to be sustainable. We can't do this once a month. We can't, it's just not going to, it's just not going to work quite the way that we envisioned it. So we pared back our our vision for our uh, for a student our student voice and tried to be more specific and more intentional like smaller things rather than these great big grand plans so um our second round of our second round of suggestions most of these came from seventh and eighth graders we looked at the themes Again, what can we put into place right away? Um, what is gonna take a little more time? Um, so things like, again, the brain breaks, things came up again, group work projects, things um, things of that nature that are easy, are easy fixes for our classrooms. Um, other, I'm sorry, all right, so, I'm sorry. Uh, so things like a writing club or a writing program. All right, that's not something that we can do next week, but it's on our it's on our our radar for the uh, for the future. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Naomi. So, how did we? Some of the shifts that we made just in our practice. So we've got all of these suggestions coming in from students. Um, what did, how did we, how did we address these things? Um, so one, going back and uh, revisiting our meaningful work conversations, going back and making sure where the places where we made gains last year, um, we were shoring those up and making sure that we were still doing those same strategies. The biggest one for our team, and it's a reoccurring, a reoccurring, uh, a reoccurring idea with us, is about the explicit, about using explicit language. Um, so we teachers were saying, "Well, I'm giving them brain breaks, but they're still asking for it." And the reason that they're still asking for it, because we is because teachers weren't labeling that it as a brain break. So uh, the, our students really need things labeled for them and named for them. Otherwise, they don't always recognize that it is occurring. We then even were even more narrow in our in our uh, next round of student suggestions. Um, we do a behavior incentive every five weeks. We also do a lot of behavior incentives at the end of the year for testing things like that. Uh, so asking students uh, for specific suggestions for um, behavior incentives. So want to increase student buy-in. Um, and then we also use those incentive ideas for other areas of the, of the school. We use our student voice committee representative at our uh, middle grades town hall. So they, um, once a quarter, we do a town hall slash assembly, awards assembly, and the SBC rep came up and said, here are all the things that we have done as a, as the SBC this, this year. These are the things that are coming up. Again, naming exactly what they are doing for their for their students. Um, again, the you spoke, we listened. That was something that we um, that we added into our into our slide presentation. Name, you want to go one more? The I'm sorry. Here we go. Yeah, sorry. The uh, so again, 
naming uh, naming some of the bigger things that we've done um, uh, in response to their to their su suggestions. Um, some of them are smaller. Some of them like choosing a project and uh, the way that you would like to present it. Um, in that picture there is their African American and Africans American African Americans in STEM projects. Uh, they could they got to choose their own person. They got to choose how they presented it. And again, along the theme of naming it, labeling it, each one of their projects next to it as a little your voice, your choice, uh, yellow yellow uh, sticker there to just remind students that, hey, you had a choice with with all of this. A uh, uh, student council for in the fifth grade classroom, um, the eighth graders got to choose whether which quarter they wanted their math test to go in. They were taking that math test regardless. Do you want it in their third quarter or do you want to push it to the fourth quarter? They thought that was great. I, it's something I had never done before. It's something I'd never even considered before. But thinking about different ways that we can incorporate student voice and student choice into our into our into our practice that was a uh, okay let's give this a try so we took the elevate uh survey in uh in december we um same same question it's an increase of of uh 5% uh, since the beginning of the, of the school year, so we are making some we are making some progress. We take the Elevate survey again in a couple of weeks from now. So um, again, this constant like reminders of you asked for this, we gave you that. Here's how we responded to this. Uh, you know, just naming those things for students all the all the time, so it's in their it's in their head. Some of the um, some of the feedback that we've gotten from the student fellows uh, in response to the what have they learned about their peers uh, and or teachers um, is that they found that they have a voice. All right, they recognize that they have a voice. They just need to figure out how to to use it, and that's our job as as the adults in the classroom is to provide those opportunities to help students find a way to use their to use their voice. I learned that you can speak out and be the leader. At, uh, you can improve a lot as a as a leader. So again, uh, choosing, uh, giving uh, uh, the student fellows opportunities to do presentations in front of their class, to uh, lead this uh, student voice council, I'm sorry, student student suggestion council was a, was a great leadership um, opportunity for them. And the students responded to it in a different way rather than, uh, you know, me just saying, here's the another Google form, fill it out. So uh, towards the end of the year re reflection, uh, as a as a team, so some of the things that we uh, some of the things that we are seeing across the across the uh, middle grades, uh, there's an increase in reasonable student suggestions, including the why. There is an increase in the frequency of student suggestions. So not just through the Google form, but it will students will use the language. I have a suggestion, or I think we should do this, and will give you a full, a full, a full uh, suggestion with a justification. And if that doesn't work, we can do this. So just that increase, not just I don't think we should have homework tonight or whatever it might be. There's an an increase in participation in class discussions. So just uh, giving uh, students that kind of reinforcement of, look, your ideas and your thoughts and your opinions are valuable. We want to hear them. We want to respond uh, to them. And so when they feel like they're being heard in suggestions, all right, it also makes them feel more comfortable and uh, more more willing to participate in class dis uh, discussions. All right, again, 
understanding that we need continuous naming of choice and voice um, in some of the things, uh, areas that we're looking to grow in is a increased uh, an increase in structured student leadership in class, just providing more opportunities and uh, uh, just continuing to uh, name student voice opportunities and make them uh, more uh, available. One of the big adjustments for next for next year is incorporating the student fellowship learning into SBC. So uh, one few of the a few of the fellows are also on the SBC. And so rather than having the student fellowship learning and all these great suggestions and ideas that they're learning uh, with MGN, right? How do we bring that back into the school? And how do we bring that learning back into our SBC so we can build leaders across across the uh, across the grades, not just you know, these four students have these, uh, are learning these, the skill set, but how do we, how do we make them, uh, leaders of other leaders? Um, one of the ways that our mindset as a, as a team has shifted, uh, with student, our focus on student voice this year, uh, as Naomi, uh, mentioned, uh, with the, that, Shared power is sometimes uh, is sometimes difficult to for educators to to hear. Um, our mind shift has has shifted into okay. It's not really it's not really about the power. It is about is about incorporating students' ideas and making them uh, feel seen and heard, making them collaborators, increasing their leadership potential and the willingness to try and to fail and to try and adjust and try and try and try. Our big first big idea wasn't, didn't quite come the way, <laughs> it didn't really happen the way we anticipated it. But after that, we came up with multiple smaller ideas about student choice and student voice. And that's where that's where our real progress has been made as a middle school team to just, this is just part of who we are and what we, what we do. It's different than where we were at the beginning of the school year. We uh, learned to listen and to let students lead, to sit back and let them explain their ideas rather than let me tell you no, or let me ask you 20 questions. Let me just let you think that through and explain what you are trying to trying to say. Our big learnings, our big learnings, start small, <laughs> which is where we should have, where, you know, in retrospect was probably where we should have started with things like Oh, what are your ideas with behavior incentives? Not this giant, not this giant uh, project. Um, reflecting on your current practices, where are where are you giving students the opportunity for voice and choice, and then naming it? Uh, you might be doing a lot more of this than you think, but students don't always recognize it without that label. You don't have to. Um, increasing student voice or adding student voice does not mean that you need to change the whole entire structure of your of your classroom. There are multiple small ways to to uh, add these things. It is a process that we intend on building upon year after year. All right, I am going to pass this back to Ashley for our Q&A session. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Lori and Naomi, for sharing all of your insights. Um, and thank you so much. There's already a lot of great, great questions in the chat. So please keep them coming as I begin to kind of throw them out to um, Lori and Naomi, if you guys both want to come into the conversation um, and you guys can feel free to respond to these um, the way... 
um, that feels best to you. Um, so Lori, just to build on one that you um, shared kind of towards the end in terms of like the reflections about how this has really shifted teacher mindsets. What do you think was some of the work you and your other colleagues had to do to really believe in their suggestions? And like, how did you have to challenge your own thinking about what was possible um, from these, from hearing directly from your students in these ways? So that um, when we were having conversations about about student suggestions and realizing that, OK, if we don't have some structure, if we don't have some front loading to this, we're not going to get the kind of suggestions that are going to be helpful. And the point of this is to get student suggestions and then act on them. So kind of giving students those, those tools and using, uh, using examples like, hey, this was a suggestion. What is, what was a, what's a way that this suggestion could have been improved so that one, I understand what you're even asking or for us to even be able to make a decision uh, about that suggestion. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing. Um, another question that came up was you highlighted the improvements that you all saw, um, particularly around that one question related to student voice. Did you notice any other improvements on other learning conditions as a result of the work you did with your students and your fellows this year? So the real, the, we're looking forward to the Elevate uh, data in a few weeks. The bulk of the, the bulk of the student voice work uh, didn't happen until January. That's when we implemented the, the um, student voice committee and they did the presentations. So most of the real work has uh, happened after the, after the second Elevate um, uh, survey. And just to add to that, I think the reality of just trying to be like, hey, we want to put this idea into motion, right? Like we want to understand what's happening. We also want to really think about how are we also utilizing some of the fellows when it comes to this process as well. We recognize the fellows don't, you know, don't are not reflective of every student in the class, but really having them say, okay, you are a voice for your peers, what is and is not working. So that was also utilized during the fellowship sessions as well of just like touch points right, of understanding, well, are they giving suggestions, what's happening there, um, and then also really thinking about um, the time it takes to put this into to, to motion as well. Awesome, thank you. Um, so these two questions are kind of aligned. So you guys talked about, obviously, the student fellowship, then how you're kind of using some of the learnings and want to continue to use the learnings from the fellowship in the student voice committee work that you're doing. So Two questions that have come up is one, how are students selected for the fellowship and for the student voice committee, if that's the same process or different? And then two, was any of the information that the fellows and the student voice committee um, learned about, was that ever shared with the LSC at Sumner? Lori, you want me to start with the fellowship and then you can go to uh, SVC. Um, so, and I, Lori, correct me if I'm wrong. So with the fellowship, it's four students per school. Um, it really is up to the teachers how they'd like to choose. I know, I believe Sumner did a student choice this year. Um, and then really thinking about and discussing who are the non-traditional leaders that we're looking at. And then also who are just the leaders who can, you know, really be champions of this work. So we really do um, leave it up to the schools when determining it. I know Sumner was really... Um, really saw a lot of value in having representatives from each grade level um, and really thinking about what that might be. Um, Lori can talk a little bit about how SVC is chosen. I will say that I had a chance to attend an SVC meeting at Sumner to really try to figure out what are the overlining, what is the alignment happening, if, if should there be alignment, um, and also recognizing that SVC is doing some great work and really thinking things on the school level where um, the student fellowship is really looking at things in the classroom level, um, but really trying to figure out what does the collaboration look like as well. So for the student fellows, um, we had students uh, complete an interest an interest form 
if they were interested in doing it and why were they interested and from that from that we um we made some choices our eighth grade uh student fellow for example is um is not a student that you would normally think of as being a, a fellow he is definitely a leader um but n absolutely not in the traditional sense um he's He's missed a few meetings because of behavior. He's that kind of non-traditional leader, but a leader none, nonetheless. Um, with student, uh, with the SVC, uh, there's usually a core of students that if you were on SVC last year, you kind of default to the to the following year. Um, but new students, and then there's some opportunities to add in new students. Uh, those students have to fill out an application and they are interviewed by the current SVC members and the uh, the uh, adult leader of the SVC. One follow-up question that popped up, um, does Sumner currently have a student member of their LSC? I know that's a direction CPS is headed for middle school students. Not at this time. In the past, we've had uh, in the past we've had had students uh, that came to some LSE meetings, uh, did updates, but no, we don't have a a formal a former formal member. Thank you for answering. And then one final question um, before we close out and transition to our post discussion space. Is any trainings or resources that you would recommend to prevent adultism when making decisions and sharing power with young people? That's a great question, I think, for us to close on. You want to take this one? Because this is it, is it geared towards you? Or would you like? So I think what Lori said earlier about um, when she kind of looped back into sharing power was really what it's about, right? I think this idea of power, control, whatever it may be, um, is something that you might see throughout, you know, the middle grade experience, even just school experience. So I know providing the research, what we've, you know, what we've been able to provide for them has been really powerful. And then also, to be quite honest, like having the voice of students, like students they directly see giving that feedback, I think has been powerful when it comes to, you know, how are we unlearning what adultism is? How are we utilizing the feedback from fellows? And like also seeing that it's going to look, sound, and feel different for everybody. And like, it really is the process of unlearning. Um, so really, I don't know, Laura, if you have anything to add, but I think that's, that's kind of the approach that we've taken is just the continued unlearning. Wonderful. Thank you so much again to Naomi and Lori for sharing their experiences and all their insights um, with everyone here today. I really hope that folks were able to take something away, that, they're pure, that your curiosity was piqued, and that you really are eager to figure out how you can do more to incorporate the voices of young people and students into decisions in your own life and how you do your work every day. Um, if you want to chat more, because we've gotten that feedback, um, we do have a post work, a uh, post uh, spotlight discussion space that will be taking place in a separate Zoom. Um, that link just was dropped in the chat. This is a totally optional space. So if you can't stay, that is all good. But if you want to talk a little bit more, please join us. Um, that will start immediately following this session. And these will be some of the questions you'll have time to discuss with other folks who were here today. Um, so we do hope to see you in that space. If not, again, totally okay. Um, I also think there was a question or two we didn't get a chance to answer um, in the Q&A just due to time. So um, we do send out follow-ups for these sessions with resources, the presentation and um, things like that. So we'll we'll try to follow, um, answer those questions um, in the follow-up email as well. So I want to thank Naomi and Lori again for their time and insights and all the hard work they've been doing this year and for sharing it with us. And thank all of you all for joining us today. Um, it's a pleasure to have you and we hope to see you at future events. And we also hope to see you in that post-event Zoom that'll start in a moment. Um, please feel free to just click that link in the chat and we'll see you there. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Thanks all.